Okay, so maybe if everyone, I'm going to start sort of and break the, the space down into some sections. It's sort of segmented. And can we take and, photos? Uh, I think so. Story in there. Yeah, just the work behind this screen. Um, I don't want photos of, just like the, the two pieces behind here. I'm still really attached to those. <laughs> okay, so this, I'm going to start with the end. Um, so that the levels and layers that are explored in this space and in this residency, um, if I just, I think, start talking and explaining what each area is, it, it doesn't necessarily give you the totality um, from the beginning. So for me, belonging and understanding um, my connection to place, my understanding of living on Kabi Kabi and walking and working on Kabi Kabi country, when... I am a direct descendant of English descent. My ancestors six or seven um, generations ago came to Australia. Um, I've had a journey of trying to understand my place here and, and how that all the layers of that interact. So for me, working with plants has been... Um, when I started doing that, it actually opened this learning pathway that began a journey of understanding and um, connection to a universal knowledge that, to me, um, seemed appropriate. And also, because it is a universal knowledge, it meant that I felt comfortable in that space to look deeper into the stories and to dive into the, the narratives there. And the other thing is, I work in process. So there's sort of four key elements of what I'm bringing today. Working in process. So when I look at a plant, I connect to it on a level for days, weeks or months or a season and then come and revisit it the next season. And each time I re work with a plant, I get a new level of understanding and a new level of knowledge that sort of seeps into me. And, and part of the way that I do that and part of the way I can access that intuitive knowledge is by process. So repetition, so repetition of process, repetition of objects, of space, of time, of harvesting, of in the old days it was women or people sitting, harvesting, um, processing plants. And that meditative state that you can go into where you access your alpha brain waves and the left and the right brain become this fluid um, and it... Imaginal, imagination. Imagination is part of our intuitive body when we really are allowed to um, explore that space within us. Imagination actually is informing us about what's happening, about stories. In the old way, it would be called mythology, um, perhaps dreaming and dreamtime stories. But in now, we've sort of separated it out and we've said that's your imagination, the dreams that you have, the stories that you come to you, your connections to certain things. It's just your imagination, but really the imaginal is part of us and it's part of our learning. It's part of our learning pathways that if we can reconnect to that, I think we have um, a deeper sense of belonging and connection. So for me, starting with that deep dive into my ancestry and I actually needed to know where I came from who the women are, and I've looked at the her story, the unseen, because I think the masculine and the male side of the stories is very much documented and very much held and told to us in our society, especially from a European point of view and the patriarch. You know, my father, I take my father's name, I take my husband's name, things like that. Um, the true story of the woman is a lot sort of suppressed. Um, so for me, working, I began... I was up in Cooktown a few years ago on the anniversary of when Cook would have been grounded in that space and I realised as that wind blew and held the boat in the reef and in that um, harbour for or that bay for six weeks, I was like, this is it. This is the beginning of when my ancestors actually became the story of Australia. So I went back and I looked at starting with the 250th anniversary, I went back to the actual plants um, and I went to the herbarium last year and I sat with 
um, the specimens there and I took two days and each specimen I would take it out and I would sit with it and I would see how did they cut it? What part of it did they cut? What was there? What wasn't there? And a part of me beginning my work with um, Joseph Banks specimens was I laid out all the names of all the plants that I had on a list that had been collected on the southeast coast and I set an intentional space and I asked which of these plants wants to show themselves to me, which of these plants wants to work with me. So from the very beginning of this process I've started, I have tried to intentionally actually listen, to deeply listen to place, to people, to country. Something that I feel when these were taken, they were actually just taken. They didn't stop and listen. And so for me, part of this whole um, residency was a reimagining of if the feminine space and not necessarily female, but feminine, the intuitive and the listening and the nurturing had sat in the, the story of colonisation, then how different would it be now? And all I can do now is my my medicine, my healing has to come from me shedding the shame and the guilt of what happened in the past and trying to find ways to acknowledge but also stand side by side and deeply listening. So the plants are my segue into that. Um, and the way I do that is I look at how can I get the story of a plant um, into a dialogue, into a vision or a that I can put into a space where when you come and view it, you can have your own story with it. And it might highlight to you a plant that perhaps you've never noticed before. And that might open a pathway of learning for you, for you to have your own lived experience on, on whatever path that is right for you. Um, so I've looked at natural dyeing and I've looked at plants that were in abundance. So not all of these are ones that Cook and um, Banks collected, but they are plants that were in abundance here. They're, some of them are sisters of the plants or relatives of the plants that were taken. And I've looked at all different ways. These are diagnostics of, they tell me different things, like this, this plant has a lot of um, dye stuff in it, so I know I can work more in certain ways. And here is this, the journals that the men wrote. These are Banks's journals for the time that I was here, 250 years ago, when he was... Um, just leaving Australia actually, and reflecting on what they actually recorded in their journals and how these men got in their boats, rowed to shore and bush bashed and collected thousands, 2,000 specimens. What did they do with them? How did they treat them? What did they record of them? Um, I'm sort of fascinated by those stories. And this takes it down to another level of ink. So taking from dyeing to ink to leaf printing some of things aren't in abundance here, so I needed to find other ways to record and to um, start working with those plants. So using ink, and if I just have one leaf, then I can do a leaf print. If I have two leaves, I can do a leaf print, and I started pressing um, some of the plants as well. So looking at that methodology too, that, that the original specimens used um, of how they've preserved them for 250 years. And as I set up the space, I realised that um, this is very much left brain logic. And I didn't do this intentionally, but on the other side, and we'll talk to that space now, is very much right brain. It's mapping. Um, this is mapping the unseen stories. So this is um, looking at the unseen and the her story. This is my ancestors. These are the women in my, li my lineage. So these are my, my mother's ancestors and these are my father's ancestors. And really for the women, all that is recorded is a name, a birth date, a marriage date and a name change. I haven't found any stories of these women. There's stories of the men, um, but they go right back to the 1600s um, and all of European descent. And looking at just... Because this residency was really about, um, it's sort of like a big brain map of what I've been working on for the last couple of years and some of the research and the aspects and it's an opportunity for me to put it all out into a space and start to resolve and start to see where the crumbs are. This space is very much an unresolved space. It's a very 
sort of almost watery space. And part of this is a timeline, starting with the Kabi Kabi people, like this country, always was, always will be, and moving into Abel Tasman when he started in 1642, going through to the 1770s, why Cook and that were actually in Tahiti and coming to these waters, going all the way through to my own ancestry when my um, ancestors started to arrive in the 1860s into South Australia, looking at timelines and looking at for synchronicities and things like that. So Venus, the transit of Venus was why Cook was even coming to this country. He had, um, at that point, it was like going to the moon the technology they were trying to chase and the understanding that the, those men and the, um, were trying to get to have a, um, an upper hand in the exploration of the world and what the world really was. They had no idea of what was on the other side. They had speculation of the great southern land. So what they needed to do was to chase the transit of Venus to Tahiti, that was their first order. That's why they were in those waters. And then they had a secret order that they weren't to open until after they'd done the, um, and documented the transit. Then they would, their, their instructions were to head towards 40 degrees south and look for the Great Southern Land and to claim it for the king. Um, so there's, all these things about Venus and looking at Venus, I've gone and started here to look at her story and where she begins. And like 6000 BC are the first stories of her and her name then was Inanna and it was in Cyprus and looking at Aphrodite and all the incarnations of Venus and her story. And Venus was the goddess, she was um, Gaia. And from her, was it her belly? No, from the water she rose up. And as she stepped onto the earth, the fecundity and the, the plants and everything started to grow. Um, and so there's all these stories. And while I was working with the feminine, I began to work with the wildflowers and the flowers, looking at the feminine aspects of what I am experiencing with the plants. And then... There's all these overlays and intuitive stories that have come from the mythology. I looked at um, a reading, an astrological reading of um, Venus, of the first sighting that Cook had of Australia of that date. Of, I um, had an astrologer in America who specialises in stargazing and Venus, planet, planet gazing, and he gave me the astrological and the mythological and the energetic force that was holding the planet at that point. And comparing that to 250 years later when we were in lockdown, I think it was the 20th of April, I had a reading done for that specific time as well. And so overlaying those two big stories of the sky, of what was holding the energetic forces of what's happening. Um, so again, this is just, it's just like mind mapping and putting ideas down. So this is the beginning of all of this looking more at Venus, looking at Venus actually creates the five-pointed star. It's the only planet that actually has an order to it. Um, and now moving into what is sitting in the middle of the space, um, I call this a memory code. And part of what this brings together the two, the two spaces. So the first thing I did for this space was to set an intention of the work I wanted to do here. And it was to find out what stories um, would show themselves and what plants wanted to work with me so that I could do the work that I need to do to heal myself and to share the stories that perhaps are medicine for other people. Um, so starting this, the memory code is precursor to the written word. So in the old way and in indigenous cultures or whatever, they had objects that had stories and energy and the survival and everything embedded into them, the song lines, all of those things. I mean, for 12 generations, we haven't, my family, my ancestors, haven't had a place that is really their own country to have connected into that. So this is sort of, I guess, you know, I mean, a preschool version um, of me learning what it is to embody knowledge, what it is to embody learning 
rather than the written word. So from this, I would hope to create some sort of um, object that, that documents aspects of this to hold the knowledge of my learning for this six week period. So starting in the middle is a bowl. When I first came in here, I went next door to the cafe and there's people um, that work in the cafe that have a creative space where they can make um, bowls and things. And the Banksia, I had a fascination with the Banksia, so that sits in the middle. It's the combination of masculine and feminine, the phallic and the yoni contained in one plant. So obviously, I think really holds what balance should be. And I had on the full moon, I began working here. And on that moon, there was a pigeon who had been eaten by a cat. And so all that was left was its head. And it was beautifully preserved. And I had that in the middle. And um, the pigeon and the dove are the same family grouping. And the dove is the bird of Venus. And for four weeks, I, resi I didn't work with Venus. Every week here, I've worked with a different aspect of this collection. And on the fourth week, which was the full moon again, when I did begin working with Venus, on the day that I started to really put time into that space, um, the head vanished. So it was <laughs> really curious that that sort of happened. Um, and just working on each circle in this code has a story and a memory and a, a story to it that's deeper than just being here and recording that, yeah, the macadamia was what I picked that day. The macadamia, you know, had a symbology and a story to it. And then the next row past the macadamia is the roses and the cornflower. When I spent a week, weekend, a whole weekend, working with roses to try and come back and to ground myself back into this. Um, I'd had just a huge amount of grief coming up in those first few weeks and I really needed to find a way of, um, I guess, finding some strength and some grounding to bring me back so that I could go and keep working. Um, and then the next layer is the um, bottle brush, which is mother and holding space for people. And then all the wildflowers. And then I have the wildflower images that will be shown in October at um, Gympie. Um, each time I've worked, this is a space that I have that I left set up, that's sort of my working space. Um, and this side I had just all of the paraphernalia that I needed to be able to create and do things. I have sets of diagnostics on the back here, just testing um, fabrics and process. And from those, I come up with um, what works and what doesn't to be able to do bigger work. And I think now I can just answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs>